Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Resilience podcast. Today, I'm here with co-host Mike Duncan and Chris Call, and we're interviewing one of our good friends, Lewis Jones, who served in the Marine Corps for 18 years, uh, got out as a logistics officer and at the rank of major. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, Lewis and I met about two years ago, and he was actually uh, in a graduate program at the University of Tennessee studying a business degree in agriculture. And at the time, I was in the agricultural business, uh, helping run the Farmer Veteran Coalition chapter for Tennessee. And that's kind of how we met and became friends. Fast forward a couple years, um, I'm doing this now, and Lewis is driving a truck. <laughs> and he seems to really be enjoying it. And so we wanted to bring him back on to the podcast and just kind of pick his brain. Uh, you know, he, like us, also, you know, really cares about personal development. He's dove deep into Stoic philosophy and as a fellow veteran has also learned how to, you know, that personal development has to be part of your life post-military, you know, so that way we can maintain some sort of sanity, uh, drifting along, just hoping everything will be okay. Doesn't always work for most veterans who have been through any kind of wartime. So, um, Lewis, we're super pumped to have you on today. How you doing? Doing great, man. Doing great, Jim. Good to meet you guys. Good to see you guys again. Chris, it was awesome hanging out. Thanks for meeting up with me for lunch the other day. Jim, when we all get together, it's going to be awesome. I think uh, we should definitely plan something over the next coming uh, month or so. Hey, is there any way you can tilt your camera up a little bit? I can't see the top of your head. That is the top of my head. <laughs> I mean, you got a, a great nose, though. That's a good. That, that's a good nose. The, the tip to nostril ratio is perfect. Should I move it? Lewis, you're joining us right now from the cab of your truck. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, uh, as you said, I'm a road truck driver now. I drive for a company called Stevens Transport. Uh, I've been doing it now for on my own. At, uh, for about two and a half months after two and a half months of training. That's truck driving school, uh, seven weeks on the road with uh, over-the-road trainer, and then a month and a half as a company driver, and now I'm on a contractor, so I lease my own truck. Yep. Awesome. There you go. And, and you've been enjoying it so far, is that right? Yeah, surprisingly. Um, I find that the truck driving life is definitely similar to military there's uh, some aspects of it that are very the same as in hurry up and wait always so uh <laughs> there's there's also things like trip planning and reporting and communications uh for the mm -hmm. most part our schedules are almost like a mission set is uh where you have a pickup location and you have to plan how to get to that location and then you link up pick up a trailer or have a live load and then you have to plan your route to the next uh, spot, which is at a, a receiver somewhere in some state. Uh, we cover 48, all the 48 states, the lower 48. Uh, we even go into Canada. Um, and so there's a lot of territory that's crossed and there's a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, the communication pieces, there's, it's just like reporting. The, like uh, if you're doing a sit rep or whatever, um, you're also tracked by GPS. The trucks are state of the art. Uh, for the most part, they're glass cockpit uh, vehicles, automatics. Uh, so it's not like the old stick shift days of driving a flat nose peat. You're now driving a fully automatic aerodynamic uh, diesel truck, which is amazing. Um, it's, it's actually kind of cool. I get better sleep in my truck than I do at home, which is <laughs> kind of surprising. <laughs> you get, you get the purr of the generator. Yeah. <laughs> and about that ambient noise in the background and the vibration, you know, it kind of, it kind of yep. keeps, keeps you level. And, uh, yeah, I've, I found that I, I get pretty good sleep, uh, in my truck better probably than I do on the road or at home. So that was kind of a surprise, but yeah. Adapting to truck life for a military person, especially when that's single, uh, has been easy. And that's because we're used to getting up and moving and being in locations for a long period of time, having downtime, the hurry up and wait. 
waiting for someone to take care of this load before we can move on to that next location, communicating like that we're here, that we've unloaded, that we've transmitted all our data, and then received orders to move to the next location. Like that's that's straight up just like being in the military. Um, because I'm a yeah. truck owner, like I have to maintain my truck, so I have to pay for the maintenance. I have got to make sure that the truck is inspected before and after each of the operations. So it falls really well into um, someone who's been in the military to be able to transition into something that maybe they didn't know that they wanted to do. I mean, it makes sense, you know, like you're kind of in control of your whole work environment and situation, which, um, you know, I think a lot of people like maybe – I don't mean to speak for all veterans, but a lot of guys I know and myself personally, like when you're kind of in control of your situation, you've got that structure to work with inside and you have the autonomy to kind of do that planning and, and all that stuff on your own, that it's, it feels safe, it's comfortable uh, and less stressful because you're kind of in control of all that. Would you, do you think that that's part of it for you? Um, Somewhat, I am a little bit of a control freak. I mean, I guess every Marine, I don't speak for all Marines, but as a Marine enlisted to officer, yeah, I would say that control factor kind of is comforting. Um, But there is also some aspects of the uncontrollable, like I don't control anything that happens at a receiver or a shipper. So I don't control anything that happens when I leave those locations and I'm on the open road. And a lot of the time you're dealing with the adversity of being on the open road, uh, dealing with for all intents and purposes, people who don't pay attention uh, and trying to use good vernacular here without cussing. <laughs> um, you can you know, swear, Lord, it's fine. <laughs> all right, cool. cool, cool. All right, cool. Yeah, just yeah. watch no. what the fuck you say, but yeah. yeah. Just... <laughs> it's fast and they have no idea that that's what they're doing. You know, a lot of people, it's, it's being a truck driver has kind of added a little bit of appreciation for driving because. <laughs> I was one of those guys that would race around the truck and not realize what I was doing. And now that I'm a truck driver, I'm going, damn, that's Fucking really stupid. <laughs> not really that. It's, it's dumb because we're 80,000 pounds and it takes 150 yards to stop. If I'm moving at 60 miles an hour, most people, trucks can stop on a dime. No, we can't. We don't move fast huh? and we don't stop fast. And so if smashing into you will help slow us down a little faster so thank you <laughs> yeah but it'd be like being hit by a tank you're i mean yeah. even, you know, like being yeah. a so, little road bumps no big deal so Lois, we've spoke offline a lot you know like we're pretty close friends and we've had a lot of conversations about you know transitioning to the civilian world just like man to man you know uh dealing with the things that you know, you don't have to be a veteran to have deal with, you know, trying to figure out uh, how to find solid ground, how to find purpose. Uh, you know, being a veteran adds that extra level of what do I do with all this hypervigilance? What do I do with all this self-discipline? And how do I wrap my head around uh, being around people that don't understand that and be comfortable and okay? And, you know, taking care of yourself, personal development has always been something that we, I think both realize and kind of prioritize in our life. So that way it makes the rest of that easier. Since you've been driving truck, you know, what kind of stuff has surfaced for you in those regards? Like, you know, how has your mental health been, your mindset, you know, has, existing been easier for you and you know how are you able to actually take care of your mental physical health as a truck driver that's a great question um let me pause for a second because i want to give a holistic answer um and a little bit of background so when i joined the military yeah i ended as a logistics officer for fourth of salt amphibian battalion which is an amtrak unit um, but my maturation as a Marine was a field radio operator enlisted to sergeant and then transitioned to the officer side and became a ground intel officer. Um, from there, I became an Amtrak officer as well. Um, in the Amtrak community, you go from uh, your forward, um, what are they called, line company officer, all the way to 
logistics officer as one of the billets in the battalion staff. So just a quick summary. Um, I was deployed, just like you were, Jim, to Iraq multiple times, um, both as enlisted men and as an officer. So had a background in combat, transition. Now I'm leading Marines in combat, you know, so I'm a doer and then the leader at the same time, right? I'll tell you this, the transition to the civilian life for me was probably a little bit different. Um, I started out as a reserve Marine enlisted, did a lot of time on active duty, and then also became a reserve Marine officer um, and did a lot of time on active duty deploying at different places. Uh, so I have a different kind of background than most active um, service members. Yes, I saw combat. Yes, it was hard. Yes, I got divorced twice, which a lot of military members, you know, we, we lose family members like that. Undocumented, unrealized. Uh, trauma that we may have covered up by our own or ego, right? We don't answer to it. Um, fast forwarding from 18 years or so to now, um, I will say that it has been a tough transition. One, as you know, Jim, like we've had multiple discussions. Uh, transitioning, and Chris, you and I have had discussions as well. Transitioning has been a little bit more difficult because it's given me time as I've left the military to have to think and this is the first time I'm actually realizing things that have happened in my life or choices that I may have made and the impact those choices have made on my current situation. Right. And so it's been a bit of a gut check. Uh, no, forget that. It's been a, a lot of a gut check to kind of realize where I was, what I thought I was becoming and where I am. Um, as far as appreciation for one building a mental toughness, um, I can't say it's all just mental. Um, what I've learned over the last three years going on four now, um, is that there's an emotional, psychological, spiritual, and physical aspect that you have to address and battling with that has been tough. I would say this year is the first year out of five years uh, that, have, that I've actually gotten a little bit better headspace, um, come full as they say, to try to figure out not only what I am or who I was and what I am now, but who do I want to be and being comfortable with that. Um, it's been tough. I'm not going to lie. It's a, been a challenge every day. Um, sometimes it's about remembering where I'm at and being grateful. All the things that I did before helped me to prepare myself to be where I am now. And even though truck driver may not be as glamorous as an intelligence officer working at the Pentagon, um, <laughs> you know what? It's bad. So realizing it has been really one of the biggest lessons. So to me, like not being a truck driver, like I would be a terrible truck driver. I like, I'm like borderline narcoleptic when I'm driving. <laughs> like whoever's riding in the passenger seat as an adult with me knows that like my wife or my sisters and they're like, are you still awake? Staring at me like, they're like, want to fall asleep, you know, but they're like, can't fall asleep because they're afraid they might yeah, die right? while they're asleep. <laughs> um, so I definitely could never be a truck driver. But, you know, I like I was making a joke before we started recording about the wheels of death, you know, like truck stop food, uh, you know, the little taquito steak cheese roll ups and hot dogs and, you know, tornadoes. Like, like, it's just tornadoes. all processed garbage food. And I know you've got a cab in your truck, you know, where you've got, you know a microwave and stuff like, could you tell us about like what your setup is and how you're able to kind of circumnavigate truck stop food and like be able to still eat absolutely. in a way that supports your um, health? You're absolutely right. Uh, truck stop food is the worst. Um, it's not good for you. Oh yeah. No, no. No. But it's easy, right? And in society today, that's what people lean towards the yeah. easy part. You know, uh, for myself, I realized it when I was a train when I was training with my trainer um, before I got on the road by myself, and I was identifying. Man, the truck stop, the trucking industry is underserviced. There is shit food out there. There is nothing good at the truck stops that is healthy 
right? It's it's not it, the concept of healthiness at a truck stop isn't there, and maybe that's what's changing. Like there are fresh markets in some truck stops, but what you get is like hard boiled eggs, some salad, maybe some yogurt and some fresh fruit mm -hmm. or even canned fruit, right? That's been put in a plastic container, right? There isn't really much more than that. Everything else is processed. Everything else is chips and, and whatever's fast. The taquitos, the, you know, pizzas that are fucking nasty. Um, and hamburgers that are like, you can't, you can't even tell if it's really meat, but it, but you're hungry and you're going to eat it. Um, after I became a, on the road by myself, um, the way I do it now is actually... I go to Walmarts and I buy groceries. I cook for myself on my truck. I have a, to be able to cook in a truck like this, um, because it's not a full kitchen, it's not a big space. Um, it's really like two bunks and uh, some storage space, right? So I maximize my storage space. Um, I have a refrigerator on board. I have a Ninja air fryer. I don't have a microwave. And we can talk semantics about air fryers being microwaves, right? Um, I have a, I have a, uh, a, wa a, bo a water boiler so I can make coffee for myself, boil water and water for soups, right? Um, I have a small, uh, slow cooker pot. And with those items, I'm able to make fresh meals. I, ha I buy bags of salad. I run a, a small fridge and a, and a cooler. Um, I drink water. I drink Gatorade, or I'll drink uh, my, that. I, I drink this blue stuff. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, yeah, sure. It gives well, you well, wings. Well, Why not? Them, but nonetheless, you know, um, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, you know, I, I try to think about what I want to put in my body because it is harder. I'll tell you what our schedule is. Uh, as a truck driver, we can drive 11 hours a day, but realistically, I'm driving about nine and a half to ten and a half hours a day that allows me to cover a certain amount of distance um and in that time period i, I take a 30 minute break so i can have lunch uh normally that's like sandwiches or something quick that i can put together like a uh, ramen noodle soup right and i doctor it up with canned meat and vegetables and i put it all in there and boil it and then it it you know i, I do the best i can with what i've got i eat canned fruit because it's easier to maintain and i don't have a lot of space but when I can get fresh fruit, I, I eat it. Um, I eat vegetables and I buy vegetables. I use Walmart, not because I'm pontificating Walmart, but realistically for a truck driver, it's where we can park. Where is it available and where can we get access to food? Mm -hmm. uh, I said earlier that the trucking industry is uh, underserviced, you know, and that's just not as a veteran because there are a lot of veterans that do drive trucks, but just for all truckers, you know, it's an underserviced environment. There's no thought that truckers need food as well and so therefore there's nothing to really support us out there that is, is a value that provides nutrition um as a fourth as as a as something on the forefront of your mind it's it's an afterthought yeah what what um what what do you think about i mean because just because i don't know like the um I mean, you see it like all the Hey Bro bodybuilding companies and everything. They've got their like actual meal plans that they send to you. And I know they're all over the place. They're all different. But like, oh, hey, you want 15 meals a month or whatever? Like, have you thought about those at all or looked into them? Because I haven't. That looks cool because it gives you like, yo, here's your getting ready for the show protein healthy meal. And you just pop it in the microwave, you know, it's not a Swanson or whatever, but it's the realness. Do you know, do people do that? Have you thought about that or? So uh, let me answer that for you, Mike, uh, for uh, begin as a beginner truck driver. No, I have not. And the reason being is how do I get it delivered to me when I'm on the road and I'm in across 50 States, yeah. right? I'm never in one place long enough to have someone to deliver it to me. The, the 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 best we can get i think and if it's available is to order it through like grubhub and have it delivered mm -hmm. to your truck but because the truck is not an address that becomes difficult right, right. so this okay what I said, the services aren't really there on top of that let's say i order uh from like blue apron where they deliver food to my house 
Well, I'm gone mm-hmm. on the road for 21 days, if not longer, right? Because I'm an over-the-road truck driver. The way I make money is miles. If I don't make miles or my truck's not rolling, I'm not making money. So right. that's why those services that are available when you're in a house were great. But on the road, not so much. Plus storage of a Blue Apron Go Box, right, still has the same things that I'm picking up at Walmart, which is some vegetables, some fruit, some type of meat, some pasta and starch. You know, it's the same stuff that I'm already doing because I've been cooking since I was 11, right? So as yeah. for, I can't speak for all truck drivers, but I would say that for myself, that's my thought on it. If the service was available to be, uh, if the service was available and out there to support truck drivers in that capacity, would I use it? Possibly. But does it exist right now? Okay, so soft copyright on an app right now. Meal plan <laughs> deliveries for truck drivers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's and, out there, but it's locked down. No one can have it. And, you, <laughs> and it's funny because every trucker is a little bit different, right? Some of them are regional yeah. truckers. Some of them are over-the-road truckers. Over-the-road means you cover all 48 states at least. If you're a regional trucker, you may only cover a portion of the United States. And if you're a local truck driver, you're home every day. Regionals mm-hmm. are normally home every weekend or once uh, every week and a half. Over the road truck drivers, at a minimum, we want to be out 21 days. Me, I like three months. Everyone is different. So the situations are different. For long haul truckers like myself, um, having access to food is paramount. Uh, I keep extra water and stuff like that because if the weather, things you can't control, right? Uh, weather or traffic jam comes up, I may not be able to park my rig anywhere near a location that I can have access to food. So I'm always thinking forward and planning for those contingencies just in case. Do all truck drivers think like me? Fuck no. Fuck no. But I've been in the <laughs> no. <laughs> We don't get... If, well, you ain't, I, if you don't truck it, fuck it. You know? It's like, <laughs> so, let me, so let me ask you this. Like, Go ahead. Considering the environment that you're dealing with, right? Which... You know, environment, I would say most people agree is like stronger than willpower. So the fact that you're able to maintain that discipline to make eating healthy and cooking your own meals a priority says a lot about who you are. And makes me want to ask you, like, why is that important to you? Like how like. How much do you feel like prioritizing cooking your own meals, using whole foods, good ingredients, really enables you to feel the way that you do now to be able to do your job, to maintain positive mental attitude, mental health? Um, How much of that do you feel like contributes to your ability to work at the level you are and feel generally good about your life? That's an awesome question. Um, part of it is from the self-discipline that you have to, what has to carry, right? So Chris, for instance, is going in a bodybuilding competition. It takes a shit ton of discipline to be able to get up every day, eat like it's your job, and maintain the focus necessary to be at the top of your game. Uh, yourself as a sniper, like, and, and Mike as a medic, right? If you're not on top of your game, shit goes wrong you have to adjust so i think for military guys not speaking for all of them because we all know that there's the 10 percent rule right so uh we can get to that later if you want to. what's the 10 percent rule <laughs> what? Oh, hang on, because your numbers might be off it could be a 20 percent rule <laughs> you know, more than 10 percent is good enough but everyone gets the point if they, um um, I would say, to answer your question, Jim, for me, it's extremely important. Um, the discipline that I have to have is easy to go to the you know, to the path of least resistance. I have to force myself because I see other truck drivers uh, that are fat, overweight, like, bro, men and women drive truck, and they're out there every day killing themselves, trying to make a living for their families. You know, they have their own mission. They have their own mindset. But what they don't have is that self-care piece. You know, they, mm-hmm. they don't they don't have a background in self-discipline to get up every day and go do something, whether it just be lifting some weights. You know, I got dumbbells in the 
truck. You know, there's not a whole lot of room in the truck. Chris has been in the truck. It's small, compact, but there's ways around making a physical uh, activity available to yourself. You can go out to get out of your truck. I mean, you're allowed to get out of your truck at the truck stops. You don't have to be in there all the time. Would I recommend running at a truck stop? You will get killed. You get hit by a truck as opposed to getting hit by a car, you'll survive the car impact. You get hit by a truck, you're dead right there. You know, so while running may not be an option for my cardio, there's no reason that I can't bring the weights outside and do, you know, hip thr- or what do you call it, uh, lunges and squats and everything. I have a 78 foot row. No, cap- man, you started with hip thrust. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Hey, you got to stay strong in the lower area. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <Okay. Recore. laughs> <Recore. laughs> Recore. Look out for those lot lizards. Still. Just in case. Got to be prepared. <laughs> like lower back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we talked about this a bunch, but like self discipline is like a direct correlation with your own happiness. And I think like a good answer to what Jim was saying is honestly, it's like how long do you want to live? Like, what is what is your time frame for longevity? And do you have a family that wants you to be around for a long time? Like, that should really impact your answer to that question because you know, those are things that are directly correlating with your decisions to eat unhealthy and, you know, actually maintain a healthy lifestyle. Um, I think your family should be the biggest motivation behind doing that. Um, That's true, but not everybody has family. Yeah, exactly. Each person has their own purpose that they should be looking toward. And I think that family is a big driver of that purpose, right? Yeah. Uh, For military, Members, it is all about family, God, country, whatever you want to talk about. It. Every person has a focus for yeah. where they want their lives to be. I think family is a huge, huge motivator. In my kids, I have a son. I don't have, yeah. you know, I have one that I know of. Um, <laughs> you know, my son, I worry about my son all the time. You know, he lives with my ex-wife. And so that is a motivator for me to build something beyond uh, so that way my son can have a better life. You know, I work hard. Truck drivers are that way. They have families. They have, you know, they have all of that. And I'm not just talking about truck drivers. All people, right? Military, civilian, firefighters, everyone has that, that purpose inside. And, you know, the Sharpen Your Axe program that you guys are building uh, is an amazing example of that to remind people of that there's more than just working your ass off for no reason or lifting weights for no reason. You have a purpose. You have a reason for it. And leaning back on that is good. And family should be the motivator, but not everybody has family. Yeah. Well, I mean, longevity in general, it's not even just family, you know, um, so the, the need to want longevity in your life and like you live like a long and fulfilled life, um, I think should be its own intrins- intrinsic purpose to having a purpose, you know? Um, at a, at a, as a level 48 paladin, I'll tell you that, uh, um, no, 40 life taught me a lot of different things, so it's different for everybody. Um, yeah, I never yeah. thought I would actually live to be this old, you know? Uh, so longevity, I think that's a secondary thought process or a secondary consideration if you're just tr- start struggling to survive, right? Yeah. You're not worried mm-hmm. about 10 years from now, you're worried about right now. And as military members, we kind of struggle with that as we get out of work conflict or we're dealing with divorce having been divorced twice, right? How do I reframe myself? How do I restructure myself? It's not as easy or clean cut as just, you know, having a purpose because of your family or having a purpose because you want to live a long time. Sorry, you're going to live as long as that. And you know, what is it? That born on date on your ass uh, was, is ticked down. You know, yeah. when is that going to happen? You don't know. You'd be in the best shape of your life and drop dead tomorrow. So yeah. realistically, like, I don't know, Jim, maybe you could talk to this or Mike, you know, having seen death, having been around death, no one expects when death comes knocking at your door, it just fucking happens. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when you come to that realization, your perspective of what that quote unquote longevity period is, it doesn't make sense to us anymore because it is, you're going to be as alive as long as you're going to be alive. Born on date. No. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It, especially nowadays, even younger people, like I just read a news story today, some, uh, you know, we'll just call her a scholar, a lifelong school person at 28 years old, perfectly healthy, happy, decides she wants to be euthanized in a month. You know, there, there's a lot of people 
that don't like being alive. They don't like dealing with life and stuff. So I feel, you know, trying to pitch, hey, you want to live longer? (laughs) And they're like, fuck, no, I don't. I'm done with this shit. Like, I've understood that at so many points in my life. It's ridiculous. I mean, luckily, I don't have that bone in my body that, you know, enables me to punch my own ticket, but I've got all the bones in my body be like, well, I'm going to suffer through this every second of every day. And I, you want to see how long I can suffer? I'm going to show you, but <laughs> you know, try doing like, you know, like what they're saying, you know, with, okay, let's, let's get you fit. Let's get you eating right. You know, let's, okay. Your whole life is shit. Let's start taking little pieces of it and improving them and seeing if, okay, you know what? Now you just feel better. Where, where do you want to go from here? You know, I don't feel terrible. Maybe I'll, you know, make coconut wind chimes in the Bahamas and sell them on a little stand because that's something I've always thought of doing, but I've never really believed in myself or wanted to do something for me. You know, it's, I, that's the hardest part. And it always has been for me. You know, I've gone through the roller coaster of ultra fit competitions, exercising eight hours a day and just, or, raging alcoholic and not even you know i'm in, i'm somewhere in between right now but we're planning a wedding so you know, it's, <laughs> it's 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 in there but you know i i i think i enjoy going through the motions because i i always forget where i came from and usually the first step in getting out of that is just cracking the whip sometimes it's got to be literally like I've I've got to I've got to eat this salad and this you know turkey burger right now instead of grabbing a tornado or whatever from the gas station. It's like I just need to start putting good stuff in, so maybe that'll give me that little extra boost of you know I am going to go for that walk or you know what I'm going to make that phone call. I feel good right now, and you know something I never really thought about was like oh you gotta you gotta eat big to get big and you know okay cool but talking with james you know it's like hey you know the way you feel about the world around you a lot of that has to do with what you're putting into you yeah if you're putting if you're putting premium fuel in your engine baby's gonna want to run but if you're just putting a little mixture of crude some Pinot Grigio and a little bit of regular unleaded, <laughs> you know, your car is really not going to want to fucking do anything. Yeah. It's uh, like having a Honda brain versus a Ferrari brain, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's the hard part. It's like, you want to turn your life around. The first step might be something as simple as a couple of healthy choices here and there, because that can give your brain the pieces that it just does not fucking have to make the decisions to do the things because you know what, when I drink all night and wake up in the morning feeling like shit, cause all I had was a weird chimichanga at like 2 AM and I wake up, you know what, am I going and launching the next SpaceX or what? No, the fuck I'm not. I'm just going to be like, well, you know, my life sucks. Good thing I got drunk last night. Cause no, it still sucks. And, you know, when people come around and be like, hey, have you tried eating, you know, maybe these foods or, you know, okay, you're, you're, you're in a truck. You ever thought about putting some dumbbells next to your seat or whatever, just to give your body something so your body can feed your mind? Well, that's just some snake oil bullshit. It's got to be harder than that. And I don't have time for harder than that. Crunchy ass soy muncher. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got something for that, Um, just to kind of caveat off that a little bit. So you're right. Uh, People have to make choices all the time. And sometimes, depending on the situation they're in, um, it affects the choices that they're making, right? So to be healthy, I said earlier when we started talking body, spirit, right? And I said mental state, but you bring it down, it's mind, body, and spirit. The body is the physical fitness part of it. You got to keep your body healthy so you can move on to the next thing. But the body affects the mind to be clear. You know, mm-hmm. when, you're, when you go and work out, how do you feel? You get that headspace, you get that that high, either from bicycle riding or lifting weights or whatever. You get to that higher state of oxygenation. 
Um, and it, you, you feel physically better when you've done it. Yes, it sucks in the beginning for having not done it for a long time, but eventually it gets better and better and you get addicted to that feeling, which Chris can probably attest to in the program that he's in right now. You know, it sucks when it sucks and it's awesome when it is awesome. Okay, well, yeah. the mind part of that mind, body, spirit is educating your mind, not just to watch TV or swipe left, swipe right, jerk off to your phone. It's not about that. It's filling your mind with the things that are going to help it to be better. But if you're stressed the fuck out because you're not making money and you're trying to support a family on a $20 an hour job, what time do you have to give to your mind when you're too busy working? So that becomes a choice that you have to make. So to create mm -hmm. that, that space, not only in your mind, in your body, you may need to lean on the spirit. You said, uh, uh, Jim, you said freaking... Uh, you know, I dove into stoicism. Well, at the time, I needed something to lean on a little bit. And your advice to go into reading more about that is not only working my mind, but helping my spirit. You know, and then yeah, I myself dove into reading religious texts because I wanted to know more. And it wasn't from a position that I'm a uh, I'm an dominus holy roller, but the fact that I wanted to know more about something that I previously maybe had questions about, and then putting my effort and energy towards that. Everyone has mm -hmm. a different perspective. Everyone has a different why. Everyone has a different reason for making the choices that they make. So it's not one stop shop or a one size fits all uh, answer. You know, when, when we're chopping it up like this, each of you make really valid points. And so just understand that there's no fit or a, a, a box for everybody. Everyone, we have to get outside of the box in order to actually break make those breakthroughs you know let me, and so I, go ahead let me ask you this so kind of everything that we're talking about sort of has me going towards thinking about values right i just had a conversation last night about values and you know the in the conversation i was having they're like you know what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about living a life full of values. And one of the first things that came to my mind was self-awareness because you really have to have that self-awareness and be able to identify or know what your values are in the first place. I'd say most people have never even had that thought before. They, they couldn't tell you what their top five values are. You know, most people, if they've got kids, would probably name their kids, you know, and look to just like superficial th things like making money or just survival stuff. But we all have values, right? And values is probably what drives you more than other people that are truck drivers or work in the trucking industry to have weights in your vehicle, to prioritize cooking your own meals instead of eating the bullshit that's like super easy it takes no effort that you can buy, you know, it's going to create disease, but you've got values that drive those decisions and those behaviors. And, you know, it's a testament to yourself. You know, I'm sure 18 years in the Marine Corps probably helped you identify what some of those were, but maybe, you know, do you, do you think you could share with us maybe just, a couple or two or three values that you feel like you have that sort of shape the way that you behave, you know, in a way that like makes, cause I, cause I know you, you know, like I know regardless of where you're at, whether you're living out of a camper, you've got a hundred acre farm or you're on the road trucking, like you're, you're unchanged, you know, like you're going to continue to cook and, prioritize your health and to me that's kind of exceptional you know because most people can't do that when they have a nine to five job so what would you say you know some values that have, like do you know yeah i got some values that i run with um but where did they come from let me start with that uh so i think a lot of your values come from your family right they start you off as you grow up kind of attach yourself to new ones that you learn about uh, so you mentioned military, um, the values. So from my family, it was self, self, um, 
self-reliability, right? the ability to be independent. Uh, I got that from my mom and my dad. You know, a lot of people don't have a mom and dad. They have one parent, so uh, then maybe they get it from their grandparents. But for me, one of the main values that I got from my family was that self-reliance to understand that there's nobody out there that's going to do it for you. You have to do it. Uh, that's number one. Um, the values that I got in the military um, were sh- sh- one sharpened things that I had when I was growing up. Like the military pushes you uh, probably past what you have perceived your limits to be. And so in there, the value that I got from that is to push myself harder than what most people will push themselves. And maybe that's why I bounce back really well. You know, you mentioned that it was a good a good thing that you noticed about me as a trait that it, I had a farm, a hundred acre farm, you know, lost it in a divorce. I was going to school, had to drop out of school, went back into working as a consultant, dropped, you know, got fired from that or laid off, excuse me. And then I'm a truck driver. So I'm constantly not giving up on myself and pulling myself back up no matter if I get knocked down. The military really got me in that portion of, of the value of, of uh, perseverance. Um, some of the values. Go ahead. Go ahead. Resilient? Sorry, we don't know any better. <laughs> 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 um, no, I'm just saying what, what you're describing to uh, is sound resilience, you know? Just being um, yeah. able to uh, overcome, adapt. You it's know? also will. I mean, it's, it's kind of will, right? Chris, mm-hmm. I mean, can you talk to us about like how your will is allowing you to be like, you know, a bodybuilder. Like this is no joke. You're dedicated to becoming a bodybuilder. Exactly what Jim is talking about. Like, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's like everything that we say in our program, you know, it's choose to be resilient food as medicine. All these things are coming into play with like every single choice that you're making, especially with what I'm doing right now with, um, you know, going into bodybuilding and especially going into natural men's physique as well too, because it's a lot different. I'm not taking, you know, PEDs, like a lot of there's other people, like, I think that's a shortcut, you know, no offense to anyone that does that, but I think it's a shortcut I've never taken steroids before. And, um, I was actually going to do a competition that wasn't for specifically natural. And my coach recommended me not to do that. Um, but every single choice that you're making, you know, I have a choice, whether I'm going to, you know, cook something that I made myself, um, on the stove or heat up some frozen chicken, uh, that's, that has a lot of sodium in it probably, you know, uh, it's going to take longer for me to cook that food. But, um, the fact that I'm not doing, you know, the shortcut and doing, you know, the longer route, I'm going to get better results from that. And it's kind of funny that we're talking about this specifically on this call, because today, um, was letter 15 that we did for a uh, letter from a stoic and the letter that, uh, cause we're, so right now we're doing a series, um, for extreme resilience. And we're doing a short every single day based off of the 124 letters by Seneca from Letters from a Stoic. And the letter that was 15 today is on bronze and brains. And the common theme in this letter is all about creating balance in your life. Um, but in the sense of it, it talks about creating habits and like habits that are going to withstand time in your life as well. Um, and the habits that Seneca gave as an example 2000 years ago was literally exercising and doing some form of educational exercise, whether it be reading or, or learning something new um, to kind of challenge your mind and challenge your beliefs and challenge your understandings. And um, I think when it boils down to it, uh, self-reliance, you know, self-discipline and being able to, you know, maintain this like stoic philosophy type of understanding of your surroundings um really helps drive and basically guides your choices of choosing that path of resilience as opposed to, you know, choosing the the path of, you know, let me just heat up this frozen chicken that's got a ton of sodium in it because it's faster, it's easier, and it tastes probably a little bit better. Um, But I know that I'm not going to get the same results that I would if I were to, you know, actually cook my food on the pan or, you know, throw it in the air fryer without any seasoning on it or, um, you know, not go to a fast food restaurant or like yourself, like literally go out of the way to cook food when you're on the road, as opposed to just going into these trucker stops and, you know, getting one of these taquitos that are probably loaded with fat and like bad fat and, 
you know, shitty sodium values, probably like half your nutritional value. Um, it, it really boils down to every single choice that you make throughout the day and throughout your life. Um, it, I think it comes down to self-discipline and, uh, you know, being able to have the mental fortitude and the will power to continue to make those resilient choices intentionally, um, as opposed to take shortcuts. And I actually have a lot of questions, um, but you, if you guys want to kind of comment on anything I said. I was just thinking about, cause we kept talking about, it, kept coming out and, you know, military and <clears throat> learning resilience and this stuff from the military. I think there's a, a, a n- another side of the edge of that blade. And I think it's, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, you know, so I'm not Dr. Fraser Crane over here, but you know, I joined when I was 17, you know, not knowing anything about anything about anything and where it comes to life or even me being my own person. And then I was thrust into an environment where I was surrounded by leadership who was micromanaging my personal daily life and everything else and peers who were holding me to a standard, even if it was, hey, we're all badasses. You got to be a badass. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And then, yeah. But then, you know, I was 17 when I joined. I was in for about six years and then I let them medically retire me since they said I was too crippled anymore to do the cool stuff. Um, I wasn't cause I I've known a lot of people like yourself who had spent, you know, almost decades or more in the military. And I think that's a key point because you learn how to be a badass in the beginning. And then I think in that environment, if you are in there long enough, you learn how to be your own badass. But I only spent six years in and I started as a teenager, not even 18. It was 17. So I knew how to be a resilient, bad motherfucker when surrounded by resilient, bad motherfuckers. And we all had a mission together and we were holding each other accountable and lifting each other up. And I was, I was pretty hot shit. And then I got out and I was alone and that crippled me. Then I'm looking at all these kids who went to college and spent time just being in the world and learning how it works. And they actually had to develop themselves as a person. And I spent another, let's say probably, you know, eight to 10 years, not even knowing who the fuck I was by myself. And, you know, that, that's, that's a hard part. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you, you know, you were in the military. Oh, yeah, and you deployed and did the war stuff. You know, that's, that's crazy. That's, it's like, yeah, you know what? You surround me with people like me and we'll take over the world. But if you get any of us by ourselves, we don't know what to do. Because, you know, I, James and I talked about this before when we did our thing. Like, I couldn't get my life together in regards of fitness, nutrition, family, mental spiritual nothing because i was like you know i'm a fucking cotton baler by god damn fine soldiers i'm not a man i am not a proud boy i'm not i'm 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 this and then you took badass out of that i was like shit i am nothing i'm worse than nothing because i'm nothing i'm not even nothing you know shoulder to shoulder trying to die for oil prices or whatever you know i i I had nothing to go on and you know i think you know the the military thing that's the biggest misconception that i think gets translated into military guys keeping their mouths shut and people not thinking that they need the most basic of help like hey who are you as a person i don't know okay well let's figure that out you know what do you like to eat taquitos why let's find a healthier version you know it's i didn't i didn't know shit about myself really when i got out i was a young impressionable kid ended up with a group of amazing people and built my identity around that and you know not everyone was my case but a lot of i mean it's the military hey i graduated high school here i go we but you know, you have your whole identity built around something. And then for whatever reason, when you get out, that identity is stripped from you. 
You can either get a fun hat with designs and clovers and pins all over it and hang out with some old dudes at the VFW. Or you just kind of disappear into the world and maybe figure it out. (laughs) No, I mean, I've got one of them, man. I've got one. But you've also, you know who you are. And you can be in a truck with a fucking hot plate and a kettle and taking care of yourself where I'm telling you, I've run giant corporation receiving departments. I've met all the truckers in the world. Maybe three out of 200 are taking care of themselves. But at the yeah. same time, they're like, I will kill myself to work myself to the bone for my family. It's like, could you direct some of that energy towards <laughs> not taking care of yourself? <laughs> right. You know, like right. what, how much of that nuclear combustion chamber that you're running to buy new sneakers for your kids could you translate into a healthier, happier dad for when they actually get to see you once every six months kind of thing? Because long haul truckers, you know, if people haven't talked to one and really understood what they're going through, it's like, yes, you have to be a fucking psychopath to want to do it and excel at it and enjoy it. (laughs) But if you... If you've already got that going for you, like why not be a little bit extra batshit crazy instead of grabbing a taquito while you're refueling, you know, taking the next exit and going to Walmart and getting a goddamn cucumber. You know, yeah. it, it it's the same thing with like these people fresh out of the military. It's like, well, I don't know why they're killing themselves or dude, you got out a year ago and you gained 150 pounds and you're stupid. It's like, well, how do we just redirect that crazy drive you have towards who you want to be? Uh, you know, uh, I hate the military thing. Cause if people find out I was in the military, they automatically write me off as I don't need shit because I didn't, I'm not digging foxholes in my front yard and I'm not still in the military. So obviously I've got my shit together, but like, you know, it stuff like that can be hard. And you know, long haul trucking like that is a hard life and people like wow dude you spend you know 21 days minimum on the road well you've got your shit together because otherwise you'd be a psychopath and probably dead well you know maybe maybe not but you know i that that's the hardest thing because i mean i can exercise with the rest of them but how do we you know, just get people to put the pieces together because, you know, listening to stuff, especially that James has told me about, you know, this extreme resilience and the sharpen your ax program, you know, he, <laughs> he was just asking my opinions about things and he just was just railing down the list of, you know, nutrition, let's reset your gut biome, you know, let's do some like kind of guided meditation to I'm like, I'm sitting there like, yeah, you know, that sounds cool gay whatever but meanwhile i'm like uh so are you gonna tell me more because he's railing off stuff that's just a light bulb for me but no one and he's not the only person that knows this stuff but no one ever wanted to tell me this stuff because i was doc motherfucking duncan whatever i was hanging by a thread my entire life and then everyone thought i was cool um, I guess that's where the whole 22 a day BS comes from is because everyone thinks we're cool. And, you know, you spend any time in military, you learn how to present yourself as, yeah, I'm good. I'm better than good, but I'm better than you. <laughs> <sighs> Just kidding. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. like, like that's a lot to unpack, uh, no doubt, but you're absolutely right. Uh, Joined the military at a young age. I didn't join until I was 27. Doesn't mean I knew who I was. In fact, I still don't know who I am. I'm reinventing myself almost uh, on a every five year basis, bro. So, what I will say to kind of uh, talk to what you're saying, yes, there's a lot of expectation that is placed upon young kids that go into the military. In fact, we break you down and build you back up, no matter what branch you're serving in, to a mindset of. You know, you're indestructible. And when you're young, you think you are. Mm-hmm. When you get out from that 
what we call the, the, like uh, a, a safe environment, even though that environment can still kill you, uh, you have no idea how to operate in the civilian world because you were a child when you entered. You know, mm-hmm. people say 18 year olds are adults. What does an 18 year old know about the world? <laughs> Not a fucking thing. Yeah. So, what does the 25 year old? I was 27. What does the 25 year old know about the world? Very few of them know that much. Okay, so I got to understand where you were and where you are. Um, coming out of the military, the expectation is that you'll adapt right back into a society. Well, you no longer fit in that, anymore. and you're trying to fit yourself back into a mold that was never that was you back in the day, but is no longer you. You think differently, you move differently, you talk differently. And you're trying to reinsert yourself into a world without guidance, without help to understand how to reassimilate into the society. A lot of people get out of the military and do kill themselves. Why? Because they lose that connection with the brothers and sisters that they served with. And that was comforting to them because you were all in the suck together. Well, believe it or mm-hmm. not, civilians are also in a suck, just different, just a different yeah. type, you know? So, what makes some of us military members, those that do not kill themselves, those that are able to adapt and overcome in their lives, has to do with a little bit of that what's within, a little bit of what came as the values like Jim was talking about, that you were raised with, and then as you were maturing into your adulthood, um, and how you apply it. So going back to Stoic philosophy, or any type of philosophy in general, is that if you don't apply it, it doesn't matter. So all that knowledge, all that experience, unless you take it and apply it, you're not going to be resilient because you're not even applying what you learn. So yeah. as you're growing, as we, as men and women, both military and civilian, I would reach out to them, knowing, understanding that everyone is looking at the world from a different perspective. You're all standing at the same intersection, but your perspective of that car accident you're observing is different. Each of you will have a different perspective on that same situation at the same time. Right, and it's where we can reach across the aisle to say, "Hey, you know, I got you, brother. I got you, sister. You need some help. You feeling fat? You are fat. All these other accountable. <laughs> like, okay, now that you know you're fat, or you know, let's work on it. Here's some advice. Again, uh-huh. the mindset of the individual: Are they sacrificing everything just to be fat because they don't have the money, they don't have the time, or they're not making it, or they haven't been shown a way or provided the values because of where they were brought up, like, yo, look at the world today. Everyone will tell you, like, it's a struggle almost everywhere you go. So how do we help? How does, how does like extreme resilience mean anything to anybody? It's, you have to help. You have to like train them or show them another way of thinking about things. You know, I will, I will, I, um, I want to go back your statement that you ain't shit. That's bullshit. I don't care who you fucking are. You served in the military. You did badass shit that most people don't do. And I'll tell you how many most people don't do. Less than 1% of the overall population of the United States. And of that 1%, less than 7 make it. So please don't tell me that I ain't shit. That's bullshit. I know who I am. I know that I am shit. That I'm able to fucking do shit that other people have never been able to do. And just like the men that are sitting here right now are doing in their lives. Because they choose to. Not because Mm -hmm. someone is holding your hand. Bitch, get the fuck out of here. (laughs) I know know Jim doesn't want anybody to hold his hand. Every once in a while, Jim would be like, Oh, that's not true. (laughs) 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 You know, hey, you know, you know, know, it doesn't matter how tough we may think we are. We've all been on our feet. You know, Mm -hmm. at least I know I have, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit it, bro crushed but what am i gonna do when you're on the bottom when you're on the ground covered in mud covered in dirt you get the fuck up and you keep moving and military members have that sense of resilience already in us but we are are trying to get out of the military when we're kicked out of the military or pushed out of the military that family doesn't want anything to do with us so we feel abandoned and then we try to reassimilate ourselves into a society that can't understand anything about what we've been through And nor has the capacity because they're running around like chickens without their heads cut off, trying to figure it out also. Yeah. This is making me think about a conversation that Dunk and I had last time we recorded a podcast where we were talking about how 
you know, when we're in the military as leaders and just in general, our job is to look out for each other, cover down our battle buddies, you know, like that's part of your fucking job description is to be, you know, 24 seven, you're a soldier 24 seven. And, you know, I remember him saying like, why does that have to stop when you get out of the military? That's and, cool. and really it doesn't, and it shouldn't. And, you know, when we're looking, when we're talking about like our company motto literally is own your purpose because identifying having a task and purpose provides meaning in your life. Like, dude, that's huge, you know, and even if you don't know what it is today in this moment, what your purpose is, you can always hang your hat on the fact that being there for someone else is a pretty good damn purpose. Yes. You know, being, and then you got, and, but you got to put your own oxygen mask on first, right? You got to be there for yourself. So that way you can be there for someone else. And I think that every veteran I know feels that way. And every not piece of shit civilian that I've ever met would agree that they feel the same exact way. Yeah. Sorry, civilians. I'm pretty rough on you, but <laughs> <laughs> we certainly know, pretty... know what we know. Let's <laughs> do right now. Brush us. I was at 10,000. Well, hey, for time, walking down the street. <laughs> we're getting that a little over an hour, and Chris has prepared ten rapid fire questions for you, Lewis. Uh, these are intended to be fun. Um, just try to get through them quickly. Um, one of just, them is not fun, but we're not going to let you know which one that yeah. is. <laughs> Why do you wear bikini underwear? <laughs> that, that's a fun one. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, let's do these 10 rapid fire and then wrap it up. It's been awesome uh, chop, chopping up with you guys. Though. Same, yeah, man, I'll sure. All right. Hit it, Chris. Um, you want to go with your question first, Jim, that you had? No, go ahead. All right, sweet. Um, can you share some tips for maintaining a healthy lifestyle as a truck driver? Some of these we have gone over, but let's just repeat them, honestly. No worries. Have a plan for yourself. Uh, uh, the best way is to at least put the weights in the truck. Um, you don't have a lot of space in your truck, but you can find ways to do push-ups, sit-ups, crunches, whatever. The biggest thing is to get out, move, stretch, do something. In the morning when I wake up, I stretch. In the evening before I go to bed, I stretch. Um, as you get older, you get lower back pain, shoulder pain, whatever it happens to be, find a way to adapt to the environment that you're in, uh, pick up some weights, go walking, go do whatever you need to do, but get out of that truck. I like that. You plan, yeah. if you fail to play and you're planning to fail, um, how do you incorporate mindfulness and self-care practices into your daily routine as a truck driver? I pray. I read. I make sure that I'm trying to learn every day so it keeps me sharp and it keeps my mind active. I like that. I think Duncan came up with uh, the answer to this one with uh, his, his app idea, but if you could change one thing about the trucking industry and health and wellness, what would it be and why? <laughs> and it can't be the app idea because I already soft copyrighted it. <laughs> um, have more truck stops. Because there's not enough of them out there for truckers to have more, I guess, uh, have the society or the government be more uh, understanding to the needs of what it takes for truck driver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing too, so I was actually, I saw Lewis yesterday, he was driving through Silverthorn, um, that's us in his truck with my dog, and um, <laughs> something that I thought of for this, this answer would be uh, having more access to gym facilities like near these truck stops. Um, we talked about this yesterday as well too. So, um, but yeah, I tell you what, if, if loves truck stop or, you know, flying J or whatever had like a little hotel gym that, you know, Oh, Hey, you got your number for the shower. Here's your number for the gym. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't it's think fun. it would be crowded regardless. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, now serving number 27, you know, you and 26 are going to be in there. 25 is gone and 28 has got to kick rocks till you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so truck stops like 
um, have had that uh, gym's concept in the past. But remember what I saw, talked about earlier? So, yeah. Uh, first, it was TAs and Petros and the gym inside their truck stops. Some of them still have like barber shops. Some of them have like CB shops, and even dentistries. There's not a whole lot um, out there still. But those gyms, like you were talking about, fitness, they kind of closed up and went away because people weren't using them. And the reason mm-hmm. being is that we talked truck drivers make money when their truck is rolling. So to take that hour out of their time, truck drivers, the majority of them, especially the guys who've been doing it for 30, 40 years, one, they're old. Two, they don't want to stop. They want to keep rolling because if they stop, they're not making money. And to them, time and time and miles make money, equal money. So All right, next question. Mindset of the, of the environment or the people in that environment as new truck drivers are coming on board, maybe offering those services again in the future, maybe a possibility. Yeah. No. Have you considered this Stallone over the top in the truck, like arm wrestling <laughs> contraption. So you can constantly be working on your dynamic muscle groups and it's a whole bar. So it's like truck. <laughs> driving down the road, doing pull up. Stuff is not as easy. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so uh, I prefer the over the top. I think that's kind of cool. Um, even though, like I said, most of the truck drivers don't look like Stallone. They kind of look like the Kool Aid Man. But if we built some kind of total gym that attached to the back of your average <laughs> Freightliner <laughs> chair, where you could be yeah. working on your flies and curls and everything. Okay. Now, okay. Now remember, just, uh, now remember, they all right. What is your What's your definition of resilient in your own words? Oh, willpower. Push ups or pull ups? <laughs> pull ups. AM or PM lifter? Oh, I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> I would say. AM. Barbell or machine? Probably not going to get done. It has to be the first thing I do in the morning. Yeah. Uh, barbell or Smith machine? Barbell. Go to, go to cheat meal? Gummy bears. Uh, go to dessert? <laughs> Carrot cake. Can't be gummy bears. <laughs> you say cupcake? Carrot, Carrot cake. Carrot. Oh. All right, I, thought, okay. I got two more. I thought of one more as we were doing this. Um, but the first one, if you could work out with one person dead or alive, who would it be and why? Genghis Khan. And why? I, because Genghis Khan was a badass and he died in most of Europe and did not give a fuck. He was an amazing strategist for his time. I like that. And Even though Jan Ziska was never defeated, but what? <laughs> It's not a matter about your defeats, man. It's how you live, bro. And Genghis Khan lived. He did. It made oh, everyone yeah. else live. <laughs> All right, last one, Lewis. Um, who is your favorite Stoic philosopher and why? Epictetus. Um, I think that he inculcates things that Seneca and Marcus Aurelius both uh, put forward, but Epictetus cuts through the mustard, uh, speaks on a not only a philosophical, but a but a but a level that touches both the spirituality aspect of what most people are looking for when they go to church. Um, you know, talking about the gods and their impact on you, and then your place in the world as a realist, um, using rational mind and rational thought processes to evaluate what's going on with you and realize that you're much stronger than the society would let you know. Yeah, that's. You know, society wants to put you in a box. He just says, fuck that. And I really like uh, his writings, and I really like uh, what he has to say. Um, he would have been cool to meet. Yeah. Definitely. All right, awesome. Any other questions, guys? No, I think that's it, man. Lewis, I appreciate you hopping on with us uh, from the cab of your, your little podcast studio, your mobile podcast <laughs> studio. Yeah, <man. laughs> Oh, and Rolling before, pods. We, before we go, um, maybe everybody can vote on the name of Lewis's podcast. <laughs> he's, got, he's got two options right now. 
Um, so far, he's kicking around Minute of Angle or the Anonymous Trucker. Nah, dude, I like On the Road again. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, what's your nationality? Like, what, what are you checking on the 4473 when you're buying a gun or something? <laughs> I'm a Heinz 57. No, um, I'm a Puerto Rican, so Hispanic. Enough then, said. E- eastbound yeah. and brown. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That was amazing. <laughs> You're welcome. It's done. <laughs> yeah. it, could, it could be the Beaner train. I don't know. It, it, <laughs> hey, what's up, Bunny? What <laughs> 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 All right, buddy. Yeah, well, thanks yeah. to you again for joining us. It was awesome, uh, as always, talking with you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. If you enjoy what you're watching, uh, if you've got any awesome comments or anything to contribute about what we talked about, uh, please uh, comment, reach out to us. We'll absolutely respond to that. We love that engagement. And that's what we're trying to do here. So uh, educate, inspire, and what? Engage. (laughs) Engage. Exactly. As always, choose resilience and own your purpose. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We really hope you liked this episode. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. It truly helps, and we appreciate it immensely. And one last thing, guys. Please share this video to everyone you think it may help. It allows our content to reach those that may need it most. But all right, see you next time. Peace.